tonight to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. You know, um, I, I really believe with all my heart this is the foundation, the reality of why God created man and his eternal purposes. God has always existed. I, I, I don't understand with my mind. All I know is true. And I know all I know is that in six days he made everything that he made. And uh, he completed it. And uh, so, but then he declared uh, in verse 26, he says in Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and subdue it. Listen, he said, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. Uh, so I want, I want to really get into that tonight when it comes to the fact that God gave man dominion and he told him to subdue. And really we know what happened is that when the serpent came to the woman and lied to her, uh, as far as it would seem that Adam was not there at that moment, and he deceived the woman, and the woman partook of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam did not subdue, Adam did not take dominion. It's the same thing in our lives today as Christians. There's a lot of Christians who are not subduing and they're not taking dominion over the things of life, uh, the circumstances, the problems. You know, Jesus told us we could speak to the mountain. I want to talk about that Sunday morning. But I want to go back here to verse 26. And, and I just want to look at God for just a little bit tonight. And God said, let us make man, notice, in our image after our likeness. Uh, later on, it says, and so God created man in his image. It doesn't use the word likeness. Now, when he's talking about let us make man in our image and our likeness, he's talking about the character, the nature, the personality of God. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad to be a natural father, and, and uh, you know, I have three sons and a daughter, and they're all after my image. For in other words, they all have a head, they all have eyes, they all have a nose, they all have a mouth, they have... Uh, two feet, two legs, two hands, two arms, natural things. They have a heart, they have lungs, they have all these physical aspects of me, and then they have some of my natural characteristics, which was transferred to them through the DNA of myself and their mother. But when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, what was exactly, what exactly is God like? What is God like? He said, God said, I'm going to make man just like me. I want him to be just like like me, a spitting image, and, and, and in the secular sense, we used to say you're a spit, you're 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 a chip off the block. You're a spitting image of your father. You're just like your father. But God wants us to be just like His Father. And actually, Jesus said, "I'm from above. You're from beneath. I'm from heaven, and you're from the earth. You're earthly, and I'm heavenly." Uh, remember what he told the Jewish people, the leaders? He said, your father is the devil and the, and the works of your father will do. But he says, my father is of heaven. So he's talking about the divine character, the divine nature, the divine personality. But as I got to looking at who God really is, who and how can we discover who God really is? Well, he gave to us his book, didn't he? Uh, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for uh, correction for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And it said the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I personally believe, I believe that from Genesis to Revelation, there is given to us uh, uh, declarations of who God is, how God works, how God thinks, how God moves. God's plan, God's purpose, God's mission, God's desire. And the very first foundation we have is that God wants me to be just like him. God wants us to be just like him. And the enemy came along because he came along in order to uh, uh, create man in his image and his likeness. 
see, uh, because Satan wanted to be his name, or his name was Lucifer, and pride came into his heart. He's the father of lies. He abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he tells us a lie, he tells it of himself. So Satan comes along, and he's going to try to copy cat God. He's going to try to duplicate God, but there's only one problem. He doesn't have the character and the nature of God anymore. He has his own perverted character. And, you know, for instance, uh, God can't lie, and the devil's nothing but a lie. Uh, God is pure light, and the devil's pure darkness. God is pure good, and the devil's pure evil. So here we are in this in-between world between God uh, which the Bible says he's the father of lights in whom there's no verminess, not a shot of turning. Uh, you know, even in the early church, there was misconceptions, and God, by his spirit, gave us the epistles in order to straighten out our stinking thinking. That's really what he wants to do. And so he says in James chapter 1, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no verbalness, not a shadow of turning. Then he says this, of his own will begat he us. Listen how? By the word of truth, that we shall be a kind of fruits of his creatures so what we got to understand is if you really want to understand God you, you got to recognize this God is exactly one with his word exactly God and his word are one period they will always be now I'm not saying the Bible is the total word of God because there is no end to who God is but the Bible is all we need in this life. That's all we need. We don't need anything else. And actually, that the challenge that God uh, has is to get us to believe that all we really need is the truth. And Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Free from what? Free from the lie. Free from the deception. Free from that which would cause us to be in disagreement. See, it's the word of God. The word of God. We know that in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. All things were made by the word. And without the word was nothing made that was made. So, and, and, and I mean, we can quote these scriptures. But, you know, th this, this is so deep. This is so... Uh, powerful, I've always said this for as long as I can remember, that the four greatest things we have, of course, is the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the Word of God. I mean, if you take the Word of God away from a believer, uh, he will not be much different than how the world is. See, uh, we all have modern technology now. Most of us have an Android or an iPhone. The difference between the Android and the iPhone is the operating system. Well, the difference between a, a, a true believer whose mind is renewed and a believer whose mind is not renewed is the operating system. It's, how, uh, it's, it's, it's the software, isn't it? And, and so God gave us his word. Matter of fact, he sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Uh, there are so many scriptures that reveal the power of God's word. Matter of fact, in Hebrews, it tells us in chapter 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times passed on to the fathers uh, uh, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom is appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, uh, who being the brightness of his glory, the express of his image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, the word. See, we're, we're, we're created by the word. We're born again. Our hearts, which our mind, our will, our emotions, our soul, is born again, how? By the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. My soul is like a plot of soil. And, and when I hear the gospel, the, the seed of the word is planted into my soul, my heart, if I believe it and receive it. And then within my heart, there is generated the new birth or faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 
So the word of God, I, I really, I, I know this, that I know this, that I know this. The, the greatest threat to the devil is not just a person who's born again or a person who speaks in tongues or a person who believes a little bit of the truth. The greatest threat to the devil is a person who is full of the word of God. I mean, the word of God is not here. It's got to come here first. It's got to come through your eye gates, your ear gates. But it's here in your heart to where it comes out of your mouth. Remember, it says that. How, do, how are we born again? we got to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. So it's got to be so deep in our heart that it comes out of our mouth. How, how do we battle the devil? Well, Jesus showed us, right, when he was led of the Holy Ghost into the wilderness. And, and, and he, for 40 days he was tempted, tested, and tried by demonic powers. And on the last 40th day, the devil shows up himself. And what does he do? He begins to entice Jesus to get Jesus out of the will of the Father. See, this is all, uh, all or you might say this, to get Jesus to let go of the truth or to get Jesus to stop believing the word, speaking the word, living the word, doing the word. Remember, the Bible says a man is not justified who knows the truth, but who does the truth. Uh, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man who beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So we're talking about a born again uh, Christian who's in the book. He looks at the book. It's the reflection of God in the book. Because we are changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as I look in the book, all of a sudden I see who I am in Christ. I see what I have in Christ. I see what I can do in Christ. I, I see the reality of Christ. I see God's plan for my life. But if I don't hide that word in my heart, I'm going to, when I walk away from that mirror, when I walk away from that picture, the image of God, if I walk away from it, all of a sudden I will just go back to what I was before. I will forget. So it's not the person who just reads the book, but does the book. He continues in the book. Jesus said, you are my disciples if you continue in my word. And, and so he forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law, the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not forgetful or hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So when I look at the book, and the Holy Spirit quickens it to me because you understand the natural mind cannot understand the things of God because it's spirit and spiritually discerned. So only the person who's really hungry for truth, thirsty for truth, desperate for truth, who wants to have a relationship with God, who wants to come to know God, only them are the ones the Holy Spirit can quicken. See, Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit in your life. Uh, so it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So if I'm going to really get to know God, understand God, and God wants me to know him. God wants me to understand him, and God wants me to walk with him. But if two be not agreed together, they cannot walk together. And, and agreement is really faith, isn't it? Faith says, God, I see it the way you say it. I believe it the way you believe it. I, I do it the way you do it, Father. Uh, and, 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 you know, God, whatever you say, that's what I embrace. Because in the natural, a little boy wants to be just like his natural earthly daddy. Well, if I'm born from above, I'm adopted into the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, his blood is now flowing through my veins, spiritually speaking. I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm an heir and heir, joint heir. I'm a king. I'm a conqueror. I'm a overcomer. I'm a high priest. I'm everything God says I am. Then I need to come into agreement with him. I need, and, and when I get this reality, now how can I come into agreement with God? I've got to be real program don't I it says uh, for in, uh, of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and he said and Paul says I beseech you there the word beseech means to beg I'm begging you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind why? That you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So uh, I, I watched as a child develops, when a child is first given birth to, 
I mean, they have the natural aspects of their parents, but as I watch a little child grow and mature and develop, they become more and more like mommy and daddy, if mommy and daddy are raising them. Now, if the world is raising them, they're going to be like the world. You know, and, and I tell you what, God never meant for us to give our children over to the government, over to private education. Uh, God always meant for us to mold and shape our children. And that's why it says raise up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, not, they're not the part thereof. Uh, it, it's an our concept that we got to get our kids out of our house as fast as we can. And why in the world we would let somebody else have that privilege? Because whoever you turn that child over to, they're going to they're gonna mold and shape your little precious child just like them. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to. I, I didn't want to ever take that chance. Now, no one ever taught me this. I just knew this as I read my Bible. And before I ever got married, I said this. My children will never step foot into a public education system because I'm going to mold them and shape them. Somebody's going to mold them and shape them. They're like uh, uh, little pieces of clay. And, and I, wanted to, I wanted to mold them and shape them. And how did I want to mold them and shape them? Into the truth. I want them to be just like Jesus. Now, that's why for three and a half years, Jesus had his disciples at his side 24-7. He was molding them and shaping them and, and, and to bring them to the point when the day would come when he would be raised from the dead and they would get born again. His spirit would come in them. But what did he do? He gave them his, the word. Now, in the old covenant in Deuteronomy, those people that came out of Egypt were left in the land of, of uh, Sinai or in, in the land of actually, if you study it in the Hebrew, sin in the wilderness for 40 years. And God tells us why he left them there. See, God was there with his people for 40 years. He gave them the commandments when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. He gave them the book of, uh, the, and actually he gave them all the first five books, the, the Pentateuch, you know, and, and he gave them Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy and Number and Leviticus. And, and, and he was using that to mold them and shape them in order that they would think like he thought live like he lived, and do what he does. Now, the first generation, they just, they just refused to. They just refused to submit to the authority of God. They refused to let God shape them and mold them and develop them into what he wanted them to be. And guess what happened? They died. First generation, they all died out in the wilderness because they said, hey, they were stubborn. That's what the Bible says. They would not, they had the word, but they wouldn't mix faith with the word. I, I see this uh, going on almost 50 years of ministry, and I watch people who confess to know Christ, and I watch their lives destroyed because they refuse to let God shape them and mold them and develop them into his image and his likeness. That's why God created me. It says, for thou art worthy to receive praise and glory and honor, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So the very first thing you got to get in your heart is, I'm here to please my heavenly Father. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to please God. I'm not here to please my flesh. I'm not here to please people. Paul said, if I yet please people, I'm not a servant of Christ. I'm not here to please uh, the enemy. I'm here to please God. Now, what pleases God? Remember when Jesus was baptized, submitted himself to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist said, wait a minute, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. And Jesus said, permit it to be so that all the scriptures might ful be fulfilled. So when Jesus came into this earth and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word became flesh. Now, in 1 John, it said there's three that bear witness in the earth and it's, 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 the, it's the water and it's the wind and it's the blood. There's three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, and it says the Word, which is Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So what we need to understand is that God wants me to become one. And, and, and we'll talk about this Sunday morning in John chapter 17. The last prayer that Jesus prayed 
was the prayer that I think is the most powerful prayer in all the earth. Father, that they may be one with us even as we are one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. This oneness with God. Now, that, that's my ultimate purpose. All of creation is waiting until the manifestation of the sons of God, God's ultimate purpose for my life. Now, there are many people who have already gone on to be with Jesus. I mean, I, 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 many of my loved ones have already gone home to be with the Lord. And the minute you breathe your last breath on this side of heaven, uh, your soul and spirit sends to heaven, and you become immediately just like God. Boom. Just like God. Just like God. What people don't understand is those who die without surrendering and yielding and submitting their life to Jesus Christ, they become just like their natural father, the devil. When I was 19 years old, I was in prayer one night with another guy, Willie, and wine, who I had led into the Lord, basically into the Holy Ghost. Me and him were praying in my barracks, and out of my mouth came a very strange prayer. I said, Father, let me experience the horrors, the sufferings, the agonies, and the pains of hell, for I can have compassion on those who are going there. And to me, all of a sudden, the lights went out in that room. Now, it didn't really go out, but to me it did. I mean, it was physical, real. Paul said, whether in the body, out of the body, I don't know. The lights went out, and an earthquake hit that room. And I was living in Alaska, so we always had earthquakes. And the floor of my room opened up, and I fell into a hole. And I fell, and I fell, and I fell. And to all of a sudden, after a while, I was over the top of a, a, a never-ending lake of boiling uh, lava and fire, and I fell into hell. And for two and a half hours, I experienced the sufferings of hell. Now, those who were around me, which were being tossed to and fro in the lava, I couldn't tell if they were men and women because they were burnt like a, 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 a chicken that was left in, 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 over an open flame too long. I couldn't tell if they were men and women. But all that came out of their mouth was cussing and swearing and cursing. That's all that came out of them. And I realized after I came out of that experience that uh, years, years later, in 2000, my mother died, and now I had led my mother to the Lord in a prayer of salvation. I don't know to what degree she lived for God, and I was really tormented. It was right, uh, right before Christmas, and my son Stephen and I were going out to Wisconsin. It was terrible weather. We had to stop in Chicago, uh, freezing rain, hail, wind, snow. It was just terrible. And we stopped in uh, uh, Chicago because I had problems with my uh, uh, Ford pickup truck. Uh, and, and, and so we had to stay the night. And I still remember in that hotel room, I'm being tossed and turned. And I heard the Lord say this. Is, he said this, son, if your mother's in hell, it's not the same woman you knew when she was in life. I mean, that blew me away. I said, what, what do you mean, not the same woman? He said, when a person dies in Christ, all that was of this world is left behind. I mean, in heaven, there is no fear, no anxiety, no worry, no sin, no rebellion, no unbelief, no, no, no lust, no pride, nothing. Uh, so even as a believer dies and leaves behind all of that which is in this world, listen to this, when a sinner dies not loving Christ, they leave behind everything that was good. So the Lord spoke to me. He said, whatever goodness and kindness and love that was in your mother. Now, he didn't tell me she went to hell. He just said, if she died without loving me more than the world, then all that you knew of her is gone. For in other words, if you would meet her face to face, it would not be the same woman you knew. Um, you know, you would not see the same lovely characteristics. So this stuff is very, very serious. And I believe that the enemy who is a liar and a deceiver, he, he absolutely is out to deceive us in the thinking that everything's hunkadory, everything's okay, everything's fine without us renewing our minds. And really this life that we live in this earth is a time of testing to find out what it is that we really love. So that's why the first commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God. How much? With all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and being, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as himself. So when we looked at Jesus, we saw the Father in, the, in, in, in flesh. That was the Father in flesh. It, it was the Word made manifest. And Jesus, there's lots of scriptures where he, he, he talked about this in John 3, uh, uh, 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So let me tell you something. I was teaching Sunday morning that 
the word of God in your heart is like the electrical conduits that carry the electricity from your electrical room until it reaches the load or the appliance or the lights or whatever you're using. And so uh, really what the Holy Spirit uses in me is the word of God in my heart. Now, if I haven't been a diligent student, the Bible says study the word of God to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If I haven't studied the word of God in all scriptures given by inspiration of God that the servant of God might be uh, 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 profitable in everything he does. So if I'm not hiding the word of God in my heart, then I'm not going to be like Jesus Christ. I can't be. I've got to hide the word of God in my heart. I've got to renew my mind. Uh, I've got to be transformed. You know, there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Well, what, what is the image of God? It's the word of God, isn't it? It's the Bible. So if I'm not looking in the scriptures, hungering for the scriptures, hungering for the truth, then I'm not going to be changed from glory to glory. I'm not going to be a partaker of the divine image, the divine likeness, the divine character, the divine personality, the attitude, the word, the thoughts, the desires. Now, if you listen to my sermons, you're going to hear me constantly repeating this area. And I do this for a number of reasons because there's a real lack right now in the modern day church of this understanding that my whole purpose in life is to become one with God. Now, I don't want to be God. That's insane. Uh, he upholds all things. He knows all things. He sees all things. Uh, there's nothing God doesn't know and nothing that God can't do. No, I'm simply a branch on the vine that produces fruit. I want to be just like my father. So when he said, let us make man in our image and likeness, what he's talking about is a person who's absolutely just like him. Now, how can we become just like him? Only by the word of God quickening our heart. It's the only way. You can't become like God without the word of God. You got to have the word of God in your heart. And the, the, the whole endeavor of the devil is to get us to believe a lie. Isn't that how he got the man and the woman to partake of the forbidden fruit? He gave the woman a lie. She believed it. They partook and they were cut off from God's life. Uh, he said, you eat of that tree, dying, you shall die in Hebrew. And they did die. Adam and his wife died. Now, not only did they physically die, but at that minute their soul died. Because the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die over and over and over. Uh, the soul of the son, if it sins, it'll die. The soul of the father, if it sins, it will die. Now, what is sin? Sin is that which is contrary to the book, contrary to the nature, contrary to the character, contrary to the personality of God. So the enemy comes, Jesus said, the thief comes to what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came. Uh, because he really, he really, when God created the earth, people don't realize this, but there's actually a scripture that says, and let me read this to you in Psalms 115, 16, the heavens and the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to mankind. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, Psalms 115, 16, the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to mankind. So in the garden, when God created man, he gave this, this globe, this earth, which eventually uh, will go back to God through Jesus Christ. He gave it to man. For in other words, he actually said that man was supposed to tend or be the gardener, the caretaker over the, 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 the garden of Eden. And so when Adam and his wife sinned, they surrendered that authority to the devil. They did. And that's why when the devil tempted Jesus, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, if you would bow down and worship me, I'll give you these kingdoms. Now, Jesus didn't say, you liar, these kingdoms aren't yours. Oh, they are. And matter of fact, that's why God had to become a man in order to have the authority. He had to be a descendant of Adam. And he was a descendant of Adam. And, of course, he came through the loins of Noah. And he came through the loins of, of, of Abraham. And he came through the loins of Isaac and Jacob 
and all the way down until he came through the loins of, of, of David, didn't he? But he had to come through a man, and he had to be a man. He had to be a natural man. So uh, it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up in the glory. So when God said, let us make man in our likeness and our image, Jesus was the complete fulfilling of that divine purpose for the human race. He became just, and he was just like his father, exactly. He said, you seen me, you seen the father. He said, you hear me, you hear the father. He said, the works I speak, the works I do, they're my father's doing them. The words I speak, they're my father speaking them. He said, Father, I've given them the words that you gave to me, and they have believed that you sent me. And so now it's our opportunity to take this amazing reality of becoming just like God. How do I become just like God? By hiding his word in my heart and believing it and being a doer of it. I've got to do what the word says. And so when I first got born again, I had a deep hunger for the word. I still do after all these years. But I just began to read the Bible and I began to do what the Bible says. I just began to mimic and do what the word of God said. And as I began to say what God said and believe what God said and do what God said, all of a sudden God began to show up in my life. You know, through the years, people have said to me, Pastor Mike, why do you think that God does so much for you? It's because I simply agree with him. I agree with what the Bible says. I agree with what the Word of God says. Now, it's not letter because the letter killeth. It's the Spirit that quickeneth. But see, I have this reality. I know what God's purpose is. For in other words, I'm not trying to figure out what God wants. I know what God wants. God wants me to be just like him. And so he's given me what I need to become just like him. And what has he given me? He's given me his words, hasn't he? So let's look there before we close. And it says in Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let us make man in our likeness and our image. And what is that? The word of God. For in other words, I ought to be a talking, walking, thinking, speaking, living, moving example of God's word. For instance, God's word said, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed on, shaken together, running over, so I should be a giver. Uh, God said, forgive, just like your heavenly father forgives, or I will forgive you, so I should be a forgiver. Uh, God is very merciful, so I should be very merciful. God is very kind, so I should be very kind. God is very gentle, so I should be gentle. God is uh, very patient, so I should be patient. God is, is bold, right? And, and, and so we should be bold. It said, the righteous is bold as a lion, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. So I, 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 I imitate, and the Bible says that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I am an imitator of Jesus Christ. Yes, I want to be just like my big brother, who's just like his heavenly father. So I want to be just like Jesus in how I live, how I talk, how I walk, how I think. Uh, now, now, we all have our own personalities in heaven. We're not going to just be like a bunch of cookies cut out, you know, on a, on, on a, a cookie cutter. No, we're going to all have our own names. We're all going to have our own little bit of personalities. But there's going to be no sin, no darkness. See, God's nothing but the Father of lights in whom there's no verb and it's not a shadow of turning. And so God is who God is. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. So Jesus said, said, I laid hands on the sick, you lay hands on the sick. Jesus said, I cast out devils, you cast out devils. Now, Jesus did not speak in new tongues because that is a sign of the new covenant that we have through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. That is something that God gave to us, like physical circumcision was given to Abraham, and tongues is a, a sign that is given to the believer and there's 10 reasons why we pray in tongues. That's a whole nother message. But God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then notice this, let them have dominion. So I want, I, this is what I've been saying this all night long to get to this point. You will only exercise dominion or authority to the degree that you are like God. To the degree that you're submitted to the word of God is to the degree that you will exercise authority. I'm going to really get into this on Sunday because we've been teaching a lot about the power of God. 
the power of his resurrection, uh, how mighty signs and wonders were done in the name of Jesus. So they were not only exercising power, but they were exercising authority. You, you know, a man can have power, but that doesn't mean he has the authority to use that power. You know, e even in the governments of the world, you know, we, we have military personnel and they can go out and rage war against the enemy, but they have been given not just the weapons, right, but they've been given the authority. A police officer, he's in a police car, and he pulls you over. He has the power, what, he might have a gun, shotgun, pistol, whatever, but he has the authority. He has the badge. So in other words, the government has given him the authority. So you can have power, but not the authority. And so a lot of Christians, they don't understand it. When the Holy Ghost came, they got the power of the Holy Ghost. But that power would not be exercised unless you have authority. And the only time you've got authority is when you submit to authority. Remember this centurion? He said to Jesus, speak the wor word only, my servant will be healed. And then he said something amazing. He said, for I'm a man of authority, under authority. He said, I say to one, come, and he cometh, and I say to go, goeth, and he goeth. And Jesus said this, I have not found such great faith. Now notice, great faith. No, not in all of Israel. So, so what is great faith? Great faith is when you understand authority and you're submitted to authority and you exercise authority. And so when you and I, when we're submitted to God, the Bible says submit yourself to God, right? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, there's a lot of people, they're trying to resist the devil, but the devil ain't leaving them. You know why? They're not submitted to God. Well, how do you submit to God? Renew your mind. Agree with what the Bible says. Say what the Bible says about you. Do what the Bible tells you to do. Submit to the authority of God. Now, I'm going to give an example. A lot of people, their attitude right now, I don't need to submit. For instance, the Bible says, don't forsake the gathering together, uh, uh, even so much the more see, see we day approaching. And so I wrote a book many years ago about 30 reasons why we must come together. Well, a lot of people's attitude in the house of God is, I don't need to gather. I don't need to come together with God's saints where they're not submitted, and you're not going to exercise authority. How about give? Uh, as God leads you, as God, now I don't believe in tithing, I believe beyond tithing. I, uh, I, I, whatever I have, it, it belongs to God. So I submit all that I have to God. Here it is, God. What do I need to submit to God? And to the degree that I submit to God is to the degree that I'll exercise authority. So if I'm not completely submitted to God, that doesn't mean I can't exercise any authority. Absolutely. But not to the degree of, of authority that God wants me to. See, Jesus, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Do you know why? Because Jesus was totally, completely submitted to the word of God, full of the word of God, full of truth, full of light, full of obedience. He was obedient even unto death. Jesus was completely obedient to the Father in every area, so he had the spirit without measure. Now, maybe I'm 10% submitted to God. I've got, you know, 10% of truth in my heart. That's the degree I'm going to exercise authority. And that, uh, that power I have, because it's in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost lives in me, but that power can't flow if I'm not submitted to authority. Now, just think about this. It just makes sense. When, when I was a, a little boy in Wisconsin, they had a, a course where uh, uh, I think you, a 12-year-old could go through and it was uh, uh, about how to handle guns. Now, I'm not saying I should have had a gun even at that age, okay, because you just don't have the maturity. But I went through this class, and they taught me how to handle a gun, how to use a gun. They, I had a test, a written test, and then they handed me a shotgun or something, and they said, okay, let's see your skill with a shotgun. Well, I went through all of this, right? I went through all of this. And then I was allowed to go hunting with a gun at 12 years old in Wisconsin. Now, if I was out there with one of my buddies who didn't go through the course and a forest ranger was to come upon us, the first thing he would do is say, sons, boys, I need to see the, the, that you have authority to carry these guns. Now, if, my friend, if I would pull out my card and say, here it is, officer, 
And I showed them. I went through the course. I passed the course and whatever. My name's in there and the official signature. And my buddy, he, he didn't go through the course. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that, that, uh, that, that forest ranger is going to take away the gun. It's going to take away the power. I'm sorry, son. Now, your parents are going to have to come and get this gun. And you're not going to be allowed to hunt. And if we catch you doing this again, then we're going to make it basically you can't have a gun until you're such and such an age. For other words, you, you, the, he had the gun in his hand, but he didn't have the authority because he didn't submit to authority. I'm telling you, that's how it is in the body of Christ. A lot of people just cannot understand how come they're not moving in God's divine authority. How come we're not raising the dead? How come we're not cleansing lepers? How come we're not getting everybody healed like Jesus did? Because we're not so Submitted to the authority of Christ to the fullest extent. Now, I wish I could tell you that I was completely, absolutely submitted to God in every area of my life. But you know what? I find something in me that just don't like to be told what to do. There's something in my flesh. Don't tell me I got to pray. Don't tell me I got to meditate on the word. Don't tell me I can't watch something stupid. Don't tell me I've got to go to church. Don't tell me I've got to do this or do that or so forth and so on. And now, of course, the modern gospel says, oh, there ain't no commandments. And yet Jesus, the very fat last thing he said, he said, go and teach all men everywhere everything I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the ends of the world. Well, guess what? He said, I'm the authority and I will back up my word if you will go and teach Everybody to observe everything I've commanded, and if you do what I've commanded you to do, he said, then I will be there to bring it to pass. Well, uh, it, it's a wonder I, I've had the miracles in my life. I've had the supernatural. I've had answered prayers. I've had divine deliverances and protections and healings and freedom. It, it, it's amazing. But that's because there has been some submission. There has been some yielding surrendering and obedience to God, but only to the level that I will submit to God and obey God and yield to God and do the will of God, even though my flesh tells me I don't need to, to that degree I will have authority in the earth. So there's the key. There's the key to authority. There's the key to power. You, you got to get the word of God in your heart, renew your mind, you got to submit to it. You got to be a doer of it. So when the Bible says raise hands, you raise your hands. When the Bible says shout, you shout. When the Bible says dance, you dance. When the Bible says give, you give. When the Bible says pray, you pray. When the Bible says meditate, you meditate. When the Bible says share Christ, you share Christ. You do what the word of God says. And God knows. See, I'm not the one who keeps track of all of this. God looks down from heaven and he says, look at my boy. He's doing exactly what I told him to do, and it's like he turns up the authority, <laughs> and the power is released, and people are getting set free. Now, Father, I thank you for this night. I pray that those who have watched this teaching, that they would take a hold of it, and they would begin to grow in knowledge and wisdom, and they begin to move in the power and authority as they begin to renew their minds, and they begin to do what the Word of God tells them to do as they begin to submit to the authority of He that is King of kings and Lord of lords in Jesus' name.